It's the week ending Saturday the 16th of April and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days, we've seen Vladimir Putin defending Russia's invasion of Ukraine in a rare public appearance, Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak rejecting calls to resign over their lockdown party fines, and NASA's Hubble telescope detecting the largest comet ever seen. But we're here to bring you some of the stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news, not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Marion McNichol. Let's unwrap the week. And Ollie's still on holiday, so I'm back again for one more week. And joining me today from the week's digital team is Saoirse Bradley from the week magazine, assistant editor Leif Arbeth, not plus freelancer extraordinaire Sachandrika Chakrabarti. But Leif, you're up first. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Damning revelations about England's maternity services. I've been talking to a family whose son was left profoundly disabled and then died at the age of 15 months. Now, he doesn't fall into these numbers. He's not in this review because he was born after the review started. And I must warn viewers that some of the testimony in my report is upsetting. Channel 4 News' health and social care editor Victoria MacDonald reporting last month. Leif, what's the story this week? There's a report in the Sunday Times that's found that almost half of NHS maternity services are considered unsafe. So um, of the 193 NHS maternity services that were looked at by the Care Quality Commission, which basically keeps tabs on how hospitals are doing, 80 were rated as inadequate or requires improvement, which basically means they don't meet basic safety standards. And among those hospitals are, unfortunately, hospitals that have already um, been sort of battered by accusations that they're not, you know, um, meeting the requirements to keep mothers and babies safe. So how unsafe are we talking? What sorts of things are happening? So mothers are reporting not really getting the adequate support uh, when they're giving birth. And um, for years, there's been a kind of pressure on women to have, in England at least, to have natural births. And there seems to be some issues with enough staff and adequate training and also issues about like, whether mothers are feeling listened to at this really crucial moment in their lives when they're, you know, giving birth in a, in a situation that is still fraught with danger. And Sosha, what were some of the human stories that came from the report? Well, some of the findings I found incredibly shocking. So the Ockenden report found that women were frequently blamed for their own deaths and those of their babies. One husband who lost his wife was told that it was difficult for the midwives to listen to the baby's heartbeat due to the size of the mother. And in another case, a mother was told that she was responsible for her death because she didn't complain very much. And in 2011, the report says that a woman was accused of being lazy in labour. So there's a culture of blaming women for essentially receiving poor health care. It also found that stillbirths weren't investigated, that there was a toxic culture of undermining and bullying between staff and a, an us and them divide between doctors and midwives. Um, it also found that wards were chronically understaffed and many w- midwives had insufficient training. Vital data was kept on post-it notes, which was then swept away and contributed to the death of a child. And just overall, there was repeated failures to investigate serious incidents and deaths. Yeah. And so, Chandrika, this isn't a problem that's isolated to just one or two hospitals in just one or two parts of the country. It's happening all over the country, right? Well, yeah, the um, headlines, the article we looked at in The Times said that it was half of maternity units in the UK, which is a staggering amount and will be a huge scandal if that turns out to really be the case after all the reports have looked through everything so it turns out that having a baby is actually remaining one of the most dangerous things you can do. And Leif, much of this stems from the Ockenden report. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this was a major report that came out in late March um, that was conducted by Donna Ockenden. um, And she uh, was asked to look into failures at an NHS trust in Shropshire. um, And she found that 201 
babies had needlessly died and nine mothers as well as that. And there were also 29 cases of babies suffering severe brain injuries and I think about 65 incidents of cerebral palsy. Um, Ockenden interviewed um, lots of these families and they'd been affected over a period of nearly 20 years. And she found that there, were, there weren't enough staff, there was a lack of ongoing training, there wasn't a culture of kind of honest investigation into failures. And there were specific lessons for, for that trust in, in question. But then she also drew wider kind of conclusions about how to improve um, maternity services in England. So it was quite a major moment for, you know, the NHS in England early this month. But th- the trouble is, is that we've sort of seen these um, reviews before and mistakes continue to get made. So there's a concern that um, amongst, you know, mothers and, and also fathers, of course, and, and the wider population, that while we kind of know where hospitals are going wrong, that the NHS is perhaps less good at actually absorbing the lessons from um, the very recent past. Well, Sasha, exactly as Leif's saying, this isn't a new story. And in spite of years of claims and criticisms, many maternity units just aren't investigating the problems that they're being accused of and they're failing to improve their care. Why are they not pursuing these things? I think part of the problem, which the Ockenden report also criticises, is that external bodies such as the Care Quality Commission, which um, inspect and rate maternity services, probably their rating system and how they're carrying out inspections can't be relied upon. In several of the trusts where serious incidents and deaths happened, they had been rated as good by the QCQ. So I think there's definitely a a question mark over how hospitals and maternity services are being inspected and whether they're being held to a high enough standard. So Chandrika, we've had quite a lot of stories coming to us via particularly two books that have come out recently, This Is Going to Hurt, and it was The Night Shift Before Christmas, which have really opened people's eyes to what it's like working in maternity wards and also the NHS more broadly. Are there wider systemic changes that need to be made to support medical professionals better? Yeah, definitely. So I watched the show This Is Going to Hurt, which is set in an Obsangaini unit in, I think, 2006. And um, one thing they showed around the CQC inspections, where they set up this kind of Potemkin village situation, where they put on the best show possible, and they know ahead of time when these inspections are happening. And so it's a bit like the Queen finding that every new town smells like paint it's kind of like putting on the best show um so it's a really similar thing and you can understand why they do it because if they it's kind of like punitive measures from the cqc right it's not really about supporting a hospital to become better and if it's punitive and you're taking away funding well, we all know the nhs is underfunded we all know the problems that are coming from that you, you know that section of the hospital won't want to make things worse for themselves so you can understand why they would do that and try to put on a great show and that's something they they show to us in this is going to hurt in the tv series but then you you can also understand how the cqc is basing ratings on a kind of best in show situation and not seeing the realities of what's happening and not seeing the bad cases happening in front of them they're gently pushed into theater one where the dangerous stuff is happening in theaters three to five i'm guessing so in fact their inspection It's based on something they feel to be the everyday, but it's probably something that's much, much better. Mm. Leif, at its root is the problem just quite simple, the fact that there are not enough midwives going into the system, that they're not being paid enough and simultaneously that there are too many leaving it. Yeah, it's a, it's a major issue, um, and you know we're seeing it in other areas of the NHS as well. Um, and one thing I was I was really struck by um, reading around the subject is that the OECD apparently ranks the UK twenty seventh out of thirty eight for infant mortality, and we have apparently three point seven deaths per thousand births, which is really quite high by comparison with countries like Germany and Norway and things. It's not like this is just, you know, birth is dangerous. And, you know, even in the enlightened West, um, in that sort of stereotype, it's that um, the UK seems to have sort of maybe just coasted. And while we're doing better than America, um, I, I do think that perhaps it's there's still a degree of kind of these are women's voices that might be sort of not be um, finding their way into the public domain enough. And we've seen a lot of interest in, in this um, story recently, which is really good news. But um, I mean, I don't want to get on my feminist high horse, but I, I think if everyone in the population had to give birth, probably we'd be in a slightly different position um, with the care that's being given to these um, mothers. I mean, I think that has to be 
viewed as at least partially fair. I mean, throughout the pandemic, women were left so unsupported. I remember at one stage you could go to the pub or the football, but your partner couldn't attend your birth, which really just expresses the kind of thoughtlessness of the government's approach to this issue. Sosha, how could the government do more to help expectant mothers? I think there is this expectation that women's bodies are built for childbirth um, and therefore not much kind of support or intervention is needed because we see it as a natural process and don't kind of fully, I think, I mean, I have never been pregnant and never given birth, but I have heard from several women I know in my life that you're not really told, even now in 2022, the full pressure that you're and stress that your body is put under when you're pregnant and when you're given giving birth and I think something that the um, Ockenden report also points out is that there is a big obsession with natural birth and luckily I think that has now that is starting to change within NHS guidelines especially after the um, Shrewsbury and Telford report but there has been a culture in the NHS which the Ockenden report has says kind of has built up over decades um, that giving birth naturally is the quote unquote best way to give birth um, and l- women are given very little information about um, you know cesareans for example I think that's one way that women can be supported in giving the information that they're rightly entitled to have about the best safest ways I think that's really important the safest ways for them to give birth and and for their child which is not always a natural birth and I think there's also a big kind of cultural obsession which is really hard to kick that um, natural birth is the best way to give birth and that's also a massive factor. Leif, this is your story. What's next for it? Will we see things improving or are they just going to continue on their current downward trajectory? Well, um, I I think uh, judging by the history of these reports, um, we have every ground to be pessimistic. And yet it does feel like there's been a real shift in the conversation around the maternity services in England. So um, I'm I'm hoping that this will mark a sea change. Um, And the woman who led the report, um, Donna Ockenden, said that she hopes that hers will be the last like it in that change will be properly brought in. So the jury is unfortunately out, but um, I think we're allowed to feel pretty cynical about it, um, but also to um, really hope that that there is a change going forward. Okay, so Chandrika, you're up next after this. Brought to you by Aria Resorts Homes, providing holiday homes and staycation investments. Aria Resorts sell luxury holiday homes in top UK locations, with a potential 7% annual net return available to qualifying investors at our flagship resort in Cornwall. Terms and conditions apply. Find out more by searching ARIA Resorts Investment. So Chandrika, your turn. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Forget the 1%. How are the 7% doing? I don't think this is like much of a real world because everybody here comes from a a good background. The world is a cruel place to be in and they're not going to stay in this bubble forever. Very good. That was very good, Katie. Well done. An excerpt from the Channel 4 series, The Great British School Swap. First of all, Suchandrika, what's the show about? So this is a 2015 ITV documentary in which three comprehensive school kids and three private school kids swap places. Okay, interesting. So what's your story? So this week there's been a study coming out from University College London that's found that private schooling does not make people any happier in life rather than going through the state system. This might disappoint parents who spend vast quantities on a private education. On a personal note, I went to private school and I find usually people aren't talking about happiness, they're talking about achievement. So this is very interesting to me and I just thought it was a great story um, that, that we needed to dive into. Yeah, and why do you think it is that society expects children who have been to a private school to be happier in the first place, having gone to one? So there's a couple of different things here. There's firstly the idea of achievement equating to happiness, um, which I think, you know, obviously it's much more complex than that. Or this idea of money equating to happiness, and again, much more complex. And the last thing is this idea of pastoral care being better in private schools. So private school fees have gone up hugely in the last 20, 30 years, and the spending per pupil 
is, I mean, far, far ahead of what state school pupils are getting. And so more of that is being funneled into pastoral care within these schools. And so the idea is that private school children come out with confidence. That's something that's talked about in that documentary, um, School Swap, with confidence, with um, a stronger sense of themselves, with a better idea of how the world works. So there's a lot of expectation on what this money has bought for the private school children, which probably equates a lot of pressure as well and the idea of happiness i'm not saying that parents ever want to do something that doesn't result in happiness for their children but i've never heard that as a first reason for sending a child to private school surely it's about securing a future for them in an increasingly competitive world and secondarily there can be other reasons i think with my parents who um came from india that you can often get quite a large south asian population in private schools and it could be about fearing racism fearing difference and how they'll affect your children's future and hoping they'll be safer in that kind of environment. One of the girls says it's not the real world and when kids leave the bubble they're in they will find it hard. Do you think that that's true and if so why is it that happiness dips after people graduate from school? I think that when you are in a a school you kind of really catered for all of your horizons are quite close to you and um, being ejected into the adult world um, can be pretty intimidating. The job market for well-educated young people um, is competitive. Obviously, there's lots of demand for, um, you know, people in in jobs like restaurants and things like that. But a a lot of graduates, especially since the reforms brought in by Tony Blair, um, are kind of competing for for the top jobs. And I think there's something about... That di- something dizzying about not really knowing where you what your place in the world is um, as a young adult and feeling like you have to get your life together and there's no one there's no teacher there's no head teacher there, there are no pastoral staff uh, saying this is what you should do this is um, listen to me and I'll guide you so I think those probably have a, a, an adverse impact on on your happiness immediately after school I think it's interesting that you know, the the comment of it's a bubble and it's not the real world. Because I think, I mean, I went to both state school and then went to private school later. And I think the point of private schools, public schools is that you, you are put into a bubble and then you never leave it because you, you go into jobs often, which is, you know, completely oversubscribed with people who went to private schools and you probably interact mostly with people who went to private schools yet in these work environments in your social life I think in many ways the point is to be in the bubble that you then never leave and in many ways that's the purpose of them really which is a bit of a damning indictment but I think that's the truth of it yeah and there are particular pressures I suppose that come from having those kinds of success that private schools produce. I had many private school friends myself who, for example, weren't interested in law, but did a law degree because they'd got the marks and then they became lawyers without ever thinking about whether that's what they wanted to do. So, so Chandrika, can private education railroad people into a life that they're not especially chosen? I mean, the competitiveness is there from the start, isn't it? It's um, You can be aware that your parents are spending a lot of money on your education, so you need to perform, perhaps. That's about a relationship between the child and the parent. Um, There can be competitiveness in terms of doing um, after-school stuff or doing extra things, which are all on offer, but maybe you can pay a bit more to do extra things. And so some kids who can't, they don't have that advantage. But I think most of all, there is the kind of business-like element to it, where if you can contribute to the school looking good and prospectus, for instance, by getting into Oxbridge, they do love to show off their ratios of how many kids apply and how many get into Ox- Oxbridge. And they will write your name in gold lettering on a wooden board that lasts for generations. Um, that does happen. If you can do that, I have found you do get a lot more attention from the teachers. Um, it could be because a lot of the teachers at private schools went to Oxbridge themselves. There's a slightly different way of selecting teachers and it's not the same way as state schools. And so there could be an interest in other, you know, the children who are doing quote unquote well in that way. Um, it can mean the other 80% of the kids are not getting the same attention. So I think this idea that there's one private school or one public school experience isn't true. Um, obviously, there's an Eton experience that's different to um, my school in East London that I went to. But then also even within my year, there'll be people who felt ignored because they weren't applying to Ivy League type colleges, the kind of um, the Russell Group colleges and universities. And there'll be people who weren't outstanding at sport necessarily. So weren't getting that kind of attention. And 
I think that can be, that's more sharp in a private school from what I've heard. Um, you will get some of these problems, of course, in state schools, but there's that business-like arrangement, I think, where that you know you've been invested in, perhaps, that can affect how children feel about themselves. Well, I suppose also private schools are, as you say, businesses, and the better their results, the more likely they are to bring more students in. So, Leaf, could it be that children at private schools are given less choice and therefore less freedom? Yeah, it's certainly a very um, strict environment where you're, there isn't really um, a huge array of options to you if you're at private school that you're only basically presented with excellence as, as the outcome that's that's on the menu. And, and I've often thought um, of kind of like privately educated friends who they don't necessarily uh, even consider professions that actually they might really suit like you know sort of slightly more professions like being a postman or doing things um, with their hands um, and although there's, there also seems to be a bit of a movement against that at some top private schools that are um, trying to round out their pupils with um, you know classes in sort of woodwork and, and, and kind of a return to slightly more rural energy type pursuits um, which which I find pretty interesting um, and it, and it's actually um, what a lot of state schools have done. I, I weirdly enough, did and um, went to a private school, but also did a state school swap when in my in my in my sixth form, and the school that I went to in Nottingham had a kind of hairdressing salon where 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 pupils could learn how to hairdress, and it had lots of um r- really wonderful technical classes that my um extremely expensive private secondary school, though I wasn't at a private school for my for my primary experience, um didn't have. I kind of slightly reject that this idea of like being pushed to kind of achieve excellence then limits your choices I think if you've been pushed to really succeed and then go on to a great university then you can essentially do almost any job I think what happens in lots of state schools is kids are not given a particularly I mean and I know you're not given a particularly it's not that you're not given a good education, it's that there are no resources to spend time and attention on each individual child. And I think like the attention that is lavished on, on children when you go to a, a private school in these incredibly small class sizes of three or four people, how can children going to state school compete with that sort of attention? You can't. And I'm also slightly skeptical of this kind of study because these former students of state and private schools are asked in their teenage years and their early 20s about their life satisfaction. And I think those are tumultuous years for everyone. Um, How happy is any kind of like late teen, early 20 year old? I think maybe later on, if you ask them in five years, probably the, you know, the benefit of having attended a private school, um, that's when it comes into fruition because you probably have a better job, you probably almost definitely have more financial security in in whatever form and obviously those things don't aren't you know the key to happiness but it forms a really good foundation for those things yeah it all reminds me a little bit of one of my favorite spike milligan quotes which was all i ask is the chance to prove that money can't make me happy (laughs) Um, but maybe there is some truth to the idea that advantage doesn't necessarily equate to happiness i mean sachandrika is that the broad suggestion of this study? I, I mean, I guess they're kind of getting there because they do start talking about pastoral care and the, the amount of spending that's really increasing at a huge rate in private schools as opposed to in state schools where the spending is not increasing. But I think I think we're sort of drawing that conclusion because this isn't generally the question asked of private schooling and why it exists and should it exist, which in my opinion, possibly it shouldn't. Um, the idea of happiness, I mean, surely at those ages and beyond after you leave the schools isn't it about the fact that the job market has changed so much from what we thought it would be the 90s and the noughties basically anything I learned about the job market was completely disrupted by the internet so this idea that you know certainly for these private schools you go to university maybe you take a gap year or not but you're going to university and then you go to a nice middle class job and there'll be financial security for life and you'll buy a house and you have 2.4 kids and so on well actually the world really doesn't look like that these days and so a lot of that disappointment can be about the fact that um, going into a vocational kind of job maybe the NHS maybe being a doctor that actually doesn't pay you as well relatively to other people as it did in the 90s everyone thinks doctors are very wealthy but you know NHS pay has a lot of problems another example could be um 
I think Leave kind of touched it in terms of, you know, people not wanting to do certain jobs, not wanting to get their hands dirty. If they come out of private school, it's looked down upon. If you go to school reunion, someone's executive of Google, you're a plumber. But in fact, owning your own business as a plumber can make you very wealthy. And so there's a certain snobbishness about which subjects and which um, which uh, occupations are worthy of someone from private school. There's also the fact that the jobs market in 2022 is not what you would have expected in 1999 or even 2007 before the crash. And so I think there could be disappointment in what it is and what it takes to remain middle class. Yeah, and on mental health in particular, I was just thinking about what you said, Sachandrika, about that increase in pastoral care in particular going on in uh, private schools. You know, there may be no distinction between graduates from private or state schools for the time being. But if that's an area where uh, private schools are increasingly putting their money, surely it's only a matter of time before private school pupils will be advantaged in this area too. You know, Leaf, are we going to see more balanced individuals coming out of private schools in particular as a result of that? Well, I think the chances of more balanced people coming out of private schools is is um, decreasing in line with the inflation of the fees. Basically, private schools used to be where averagely um, posh and arist- aristocratic uh, British people would um, plonk their children. But now um, it's becoming increasingly the kind of you know, where it's sort of very, very, very wealthy people who work usually in um, moving money around um, and, you know, the kind of global rich um, end up sending their children. And um, and that's uh, because of the, the, the massive fees increase. But the study quite interestingly says that there might be a kind of a, an actual growing gap between um, the sort of uh, mental well-being of uh, privately educated Uh, pupils and state educated pupils uh, because of the pandemic because as you say like private schools have have poured cash into um into their pastoral care and and also we've seen scandals that were kind of started um in the in 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 the kind of private school world about the behavior of privately educated boys towards um their you know privately educated girls and i think those scandals have kind of woken up private schools perhaps you know more even than in state schools to the needs of um of pupils and maybe that that will translate um over time to to there being a bit of a a bigger gap opening up i think maybe this is slightly colored by me going from two extreme examples from one like fairly you know tough state school to then one extremely nice private school when i was in uh, 16 and i think it's what what are we talking about when we talk about pastoral care because i think pastoral care in a state school is often social work it's making sure children have the ability to come to school um that they're getting enough to eat at home um you know like things like that um and i'm not saying every state school is like that but there are you know serious you know kind of socioeconomic issues that that are at play at um, state schools whereas you know pri- private schooling is is more focused on kind of like I, I would imagine uh, pastoral care is more kind of you know meditation relaxation techniques um, etc so you know they're both kind of what we mean by pastoral care is like extremely different in both each setting I think. So Chandra, could we pick these stories because we uh, imagine that they might have repercussions for all our lives? What's the repercussion of this one this week for you? Well, just, you know, the 7% of the UK population is educated at private schools. And yet you will find privately educated people in all the jobs that govern our lives, right? Like in the judiciary, in the government, um, top levels of the NHS, um, pick a thing that's a really important institution and you'll get huge numbers, you know, private school kids are well overrepresented. So what is causing that? And if those people are all really unhappy, what does it mean for us? Like what's going to happen to the rest of us? So I do think we do have to delve into this. We do have to investigate. Um, first of all, it's those networks that are built at school, right? And those networks, I think, probably come into really powerful effects in your 30s when you see some of your friends starting to get really incredible jobs. And those networks do lead to a situation where we have overrepresentation of people whose educations were bought in certain jobs. So, yeah, if they're unhappy, we're unhappy, aren't we? <laughs> OK, Sorsha, you're up next after this. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so Asha, you're finishing the show. What do you think this week should be remembered for? So it seems that humans aren't natural born animal killers after all. In meat eating cultures around the world, out of over 7 million animal species, people tend to classify only a handful as edible. All the rest are inedible and disgusting. So the question is, why are we not disgusted by the select species we have learned to think of as edible? And why don't we ever ask why? Psychology and sociology professor at the University of Massachusetts, Melanie Joy, delivering a TEDx talk back in 2015. Saoirse, what's the story this week? So a study from the University of Exeter suggests that we are not born believing that certain animals are food, but we only start to see animals as food as we enter adulthood. So the study found that in general, children believe farm animals, such as pigs, should be treated as well as humans, but we lose this belief as we grow up and enter adolescence. Right, so what does this mean exactly? That eating animals and seeing them as food, that's not our natural instinct? So the study suggests that eating animals and seeing them as food is not our natural instincts and in fact children don't see as animals as food and are more likely to see them as friends or pets and then as we grow up over time we we build this moral hierarchy and divide animals into categories of food or non-food and that changes how we view them in, in all sorts of ways and of course it changes across cultures as well. Yeah, well, so Chandrika, it's interesting to see which animals different parts of the world see as food and which others see, uh, see those same animals as sacred or even pets. Why are we sentimental about some animals and not others? And why do you feel disgust for certain animals as well? I think that's really interesting. So what first came to mind was if you go to India, go to McDonald's, you're not getting a beef burger. You're not getting a pork McRib if that's in season. Um, you are getting a lamb burger. And so obviously cows are sacred to Hindus and pigs are haram or forbidden for Muslims. And those are the two main religions in India. Um, you have to have a McDonald's or other restaurants catering to them. But if you go to the South, actually, if you go to Goa and other places, you might find the menus a little bit different is um you know a lot more christianity is practiced in the south and it's interesting in one sort of huge subcontinent that you have all these different divisions amongst sort of people who live and mingle among each other um, but there's a really big example in um, china there's yulin which is a festival of lychee and dog meat in southern china um so this caused a lot of uproar from us in the west we're very happy to eat cows and, and pigs and lots of other animals but we don't like the thought of people eating dogs and um, the festival has come under fire in certain ways um around the dogs being killed humanely and so on but the fact is sort of us in the West, our instant reaction is disgust. And then um, there was a bit of a conversation um, during the pandemic about the octopus. So there was a, a show that came out called My Octopus Teacher. Some of you might have seen it. And this idea of the octopus being intelligent is something that we also, um, we tend to anthropomorphize certain animals. And if they have intelligence or they have something in common with us, we find it harder to eat them. Or we can certainly argue that way. We can find the disgust somewhere within us. Um, but if it's an animal that we see as um, working with us like dogs or horses, they're seen as like domesticated and and sort of working alongside us, we find it hard to eat them. But something like a pig or a cow, um, we have different names for them when they hit the plate. And I think that's how we get children to disassociate the two and kind of get meat eating to become normal. Leaf, Dr. Maguire, who led this study, I suppose that's what he was driving at. He was talking about the moral intelligence of children being potentially a valuable lesson for adults. Is learning from children's sense of morality what we should be taking from this? I am pretty sceptical that that's what we should be taking from it um, because, you know, if you ask children to um, rate the kind of value um, of animals and humans, they, they often seem to sort of conflate the two. So it, it, by that logic, you would say a mouse is basically the same. Um, you know, we should protect a mouse as much as we protect um, a child or a person. And that's um, not a world in which I frankly want to live um, and would be a really complicated one. So much as I, I, I kind of appreciate the, the kind of benevolence um, that that comes through, um, you know, of children that comes through in this survey. I also am a bit um, sceptical about it. Um, at the same time, the study is making quite an interesting point that to mitigate climate change, what we really need to do, or one of the many things we need to do, is to reduce um, meat consumption 
And given so many people uh, love eating meat, but the desire to kind of, you know, eat meat um, isn't necessarily there when you, uh, or inherent in children. Maybe there is something to be, um, to be said for trying to delay this, this, um, this onset of the, of the um, speciesism that we've been talking about um, so that people um, don't want to eat meat um, as early on um, or ever. Um, but I, but I, but I am not really keen on the idea of thinking that just because children think something that um, the whole of adult society um, should follow their lead. Um, because after all, societies have have evolved um, pretty successfully to um, for, for for human flourishing, and I'm not sure that a, a world run by children would be um, a particularly good one. So, Asha, the creation of animal products is a business, and since plant-based alternatives are on the rise, not least for the reasons that Leaf was mentioning there, you know, about environmentalism specifically, do you think that we'll start to see a sea change in at least how ethically our animal products are produced? Oh, I think definitely. I mean, I think we essentially will all have to eat a mostly plant-based diet in the near future. Um, And I, what is you know kind of one of the things that the study suggested is that if we can nudge children towards eating a plant-based diet early on then that is an easier way of nudging people to you know society at large to eating a um, plant-based diet which is almost definitely where we will have to end up Mm. So Chandrika, coming back to that moral question, the study found that adults learn effective strategies to solve inner moral conflicts regarding animal treatment. I don't know if you, like Sorsha, are a a meat eater, but what are those strategies that we tell ourselves for why it's okay to eat, particularly some animals and not others? I think, yeah, I do eat meat, but um, I agree with what Sorsha's saying about us moving towards a plant-based diet, and I definitely find myself thinking about what I eat, eating meat much less often and being very open to vegetarian and vegan options. They're, they're much better than they used to be, so I'm really up for them. Um, but I think that like, we do ascribe a morality to eating living things. And it used to be um, for everyone that these animals are intelligent or these animals are made for us to eat or these animals are below us in the food chain or these animals are disgusting for whatever reason. I, this... Um, getting ready for this podcast reminded me of the 2013 Tesco horse meat scandal when beef burgers were found to be 29% horse meat and we were all disgusted so I think all of these things are about beliefs aren't they and about um having a, a moral structure around living things and what we ascribe to and for me the morality ascribed by climate change and how the future is going to be affected by what we do now is very effective. It makes me really rethink what I eat, how it's produced, where it comes from, uh, the, the choices I can make to to try and change that. So if we cut down on demand for, for instance, beef, then ideally um, cows won't be farmed so intensely on land where rainforest has been cut down and all of this should help with our emissions. So I think at the moment that kind of moral framework around eating living things is actually really helpful because it gives us a larger overview. But when it is around disgust or how close the animal is to us, either genetically or in terms of intelligence, I'm not, I mean, a lot of us have been brought up with that kind of moral framework around eating animals. It's clearly not that helpful. Um, The idea of eating something intelligent makes us worry that we could be eaten, I think, at a basic level. It sounds ridiculous (laughs) to say it, right? That's surely what it is. If an octopus is intelligent and it's the only other creature outside of humans who can use tools, they use shells uh, to make little homes, which... I mean, how adorable is that? I could never eat an octopus again now. Um, I think I this, can. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get in this little shell house and find it. Um, yeah, I think it's such an interesting Thank you for area. Thank you know where they live. <laughs> <laughs> she knows now. Um, it's so interesting that a lot of this stuff is encoded in religion and in really deep cultural beliefs, isn't it? Because it probably started with, like, say, for instance, with cows in India, it probably started with... Um, a disease that was being carried by cows or a disease that was present in beef. And I mean, we've had that in the UK in the 80s with um, uh, mad cow disease. And so that that kind of incident then becomes a a long-term belief that tries to help other people stay safe. But in fact, do they work? Do they lead towards a better world? Do they work in terms of everyone having enough to eat? I think we do have to think about those bigger questions now. Well, 
That's a vegetarian wrap for this week. Thanks to Sorsha, Leaf, and Sachandrika for their stories. Ollie will be back next week, and remember you can follow this show for free and get every episode as soon as it's released. Just search for The Week Unwrapped wherever you get your podcasts. And please do check out our sister show, The Overview, as well. I've been Ariane McNichol. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Sophie King at Rethink Audio. And until next time, bye-bye.